Good morning, everybody. I'm Jesse Weber, and welcome back to Law and Crime Live. This is where we cover some of the most interesting live trials in the country today. And today we have a very busy day for you because not only do we have an exciting live trial out for you right now, we are carefully looking at a courtroom feed for a verdict watch, and I'm going to preview an amazing case that we're going to be covering for you later this week. But let's start off with our live trial of the day. This is the Tex MacGyver case out of Atlanta. You know, we've been following this constantly, gavel to gavel. This is that case of that prominent local attorney who is on trial for shooting and killing his wife, Diane MacGyver, by shooting her from the back seat of a moving car. Okay. Now, he is claiming that this was all a tragic accident, that the gun went off by accident. But the prosecution is not having any of that. They are saying that he did this for financial gain, that he had more to gain with Diane MacGyver dead than alive. Now, what we are going to see today is probably the conclusion of the prosecution's case. I believe they only are going to call a few more witnesses and then we're going to wait and see what the defense does. Now, they've been great at poking holes in the prosecution's case, and we'll talk all about that later today. I am carefully monitoring the courtroom feed. As soon as it's live, we'll make sure to go to it. But there's a lot to talk about in this case, so stand by on that one. As I said, we are also in verdict watch in another case. Now, this one is out of Ohio. You know, we've been covering the William Knight case. This guy, okay, this guy is on trial for shooting and killing an unarmed man over a dirt bike. That's right. There was an altercation about trying to recover a stolen dirt bike, and William Knight, you see him right there, shot and killed 24-year-old Keith Johnson. Now, he is claiming, Mr. Knight, that this was all self-defense, that during this altercation, Mr. Johnson got on that dirt bike and posed a threat to his daughter and his son-in-law. Now, the both sides have presented their case. The jury is currently deliberating. As soon as we have an update, as soon as we have a verdict, we will make sure to let you know. We'll go directly into the courtroom, but we're going to talk about that case as well. But finally, finally, I have to mention another huge case that we're covering here on Law and Crime. This is the case of David Copperfield. Now, the jury is still being selected in this case, but it is really, really, how should I say this, unique? I don't think I've heard a case like this, and the best part to describe it is not even me describing it. We have a short preview of it, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about it. Take a look. World-famous delusionist David Copperfield might be forced to break the cardinal rule of magic and reveal the secrets of his illusions in open court. Copperfield is being sued in Las Vegas civil court by 57-year-old Gavin Cox, who claims he was injured during a 2013 Copperfield show in Las Vegas. The British tourist, who once cooked for British royalty, claims he fell and struck his head on the ground after tripping over construction debris as one of Copperfield's assistants whisked him and other audience members through a dark secret passageway during the disappearing stunt. Cox claims he suffered brain trauma and is forced to wear an oxygen lung at night because he stops breathing when he's asleep. He's seeking punitive damages from Copperfield and MGM for alleged negligence. The illusionist and hotel strongly deny all claims, stating Cox's injuries were pre-existing and or unrelated medical conditions. This is Aaron Keller for the Law and Crime Network. Obviously, there's some serious injuries involved in this case, but really? We might learn some magic tricks in throughout this, so that I'm really looking forward to. As soon as we have an update in that case, as soon as it goes live, we'll make sure to cover it here on Law & Crime. But right now, there's so many cases to talk about, so I'm very excited, ladies and gentlemen, to bring with you right now my guest for this morning in studio. He's not on Skype. In studio, criminal defense attorney Mark Eiglarsh. Mark, it's great to have you here. What an honor to be here. We're, we're breaking many codes, New York codes, apparently. There should never be this much hair product in one place at one time they say it's it's a yeah. problem it's a problem um law and crime has an expense for the amount of hair product and it, we're not making a profit very liberal of it. use I would say. <laughs> now mark while i have you here i want to talk about the big case of the day i want to talk about the tex macgyver case we saw and i'm going to play for our viewers some of the testimony we have seen countless witnesses being put forward by the prosecution to say that mr macgyver tried to cover this up that he intentionally killed his wife. He tried to cover this up. We saw yesterday Bill Crane, who's a PR specialist, testify and say that MacGyver was changing his stories. But I ask you this, how much is it trying to cover up a murder as opposed to somebody who knew that he did something wrong? He shot his wife, there's no right. denying that. Right, right. And just trying to cover up getting in trouble. Right. Here's the bigger issue. 
bigger issue, the prosecutor wants to make him look bad. They're trying to do that any way possible. The more he looks bad, the more likely it is they don't like him, and they're willing to see it the way the prosecutors want him to see it. You understand? That there, there's no smoking gun here. There's no busload of nuns who said, we know for sure he did it this way. It's more what was in his head, what was in his mind. That's very hard to prove. So they're trying to make him first look bad, the same way defense lawyers make victims look bad. Do you think that the strategy was a good one in the sense, let's prove motive first. We're going to go all financial, show everything that his deteriorating financial situation, show their relationship, and then later on towards the end of the case, we'll show oh, this is what actually happened in the car with the ballistics. Do you think that yeah. was a good strategy? 100%. They always say that you never have to prove motive at all in a murder case. I say bull. You must, because the absence of a motive tends to suggest to the jurors that maybe the person didn't do it or some type of mistake like they're alleging here. So you must show that this guy had millions of reasons to kill her. And then later on in the trial, they'll get into this ambiguous stuff like him calling somebody from jail to try to get him out and pull favors to make him look like he's privileged and he's not a good fellow, which is really what that's about. Well, how do you think the defense has done so far in poking holes in that? Because I can imagine a scenario where he might not be found guilty of murder. Now, it still has to be wait to see if they're going to include a lesser included, which I think they should do yeah. because he was originally charged with involuntary manslaughter. And I thought that was an open shut case. But take the murder charge away. The influencing witness charges, I think there's more meat to those than maybe the murder charges. No question. Very powerful to have somebody who clearly still likes the defendant. I mean, they were friends, this guy Crane and him, very close, and reluctantly he had to get up there and say, he was telling me to, to change the story, change the narrative, and I wasn't willing to do that. Um, so, yeah, that's, a, that's, that's one he might not be able to avoid. Speaking of Crane, I'm going to play his clip in a minute. This is testimony from him from yesterday. But before we do that, as I carefully watch the courtroom feed, I have to get your opinion on this. I'm not sure how much longer the prosecution's case will go. I think it's going to Soon. conclude today. On one hand, they the, said, how many witnesses they have? They only have a few more, how long right. that will last. So if the defense begins their case today, what do you expect for them to do? Who are they going to call to the stand? What is their strategy? Um, because I think they've done a good job at poking holes so far in the prosecution's case, mm -hmm. but how do they drive it home? Two major points. One, if they can show it, that he didn't have a financial benefit to having her killed. Somehow create a reasonable doubt or show, no, he was better off with having her alive. Right. That's one. Secondly, try to show how much he loved her how he had no interest in having her harmed. You saw his reaction after he seemed to have the right effect for somebody who had just killed someone that they love. That's what you do. That's an interesting strategy. And we're going to talk more about that because you, you, you saw a lot of prosecution witnesses who would testify to things that the prosecution wasn't too happy to, for them to testify to. But yesterday was one of a, the key witnesses in this case, Bill Crane, okay? This is that PR specialist. We've talked about him since the beginning of this case. So let's play you some of his testimony from yesterday. He said that to you? Yes. So what did you say back to him? I said, I'm sorry. I certainly didn't take any of this on to help you, to hurt you or to help hurt your legal case. I told him then and subsequently several times in addition, if you subtract the fear of unrest and what occurred the night prior in Atlanta, it sort of erased the board, if you will, of any reference to the Black Lives Matters protesters, which also the week prior in Charlotte had become violent in Charlotte, North Carolina, where a state of emergency was declared, um, a protester was killed, um, in lower downtown Charlotte, a nice part of downtown Charlotte. Um, then what you have left is Mr. MacGyver being afraid of homeless people. And it struck me that if you were just afraid of homeless people in Atlanta, based on history, you probably wouldn't need your gun. So I explained to him, though I understood why he was getting pressure and that he was concerned that I thought this would blow over and that I felt that if you subtract or start changing or altering your story to anyone, to law enforcement, to later the, the district attorney's office, you're only going to cause yourself a bigger problem than any one comment in the story. And again, commented and suggested getting on videotape and in writing as crisp and clear an accounting as he could while his memory was fresh now 
and then perhaps releasing that later, but he would have it. And once the person in the car, or the driver, Danny Joe Carter's statements were out there, what I had said would largely be irrelevant. Okay. And Judge, I will represent to the court. I'm about to make a shift. This is a good time for a This would be a good time for a break. Ladies and gentlemen, um, it's almost 3.30, so we're going to take our afternoon break at this point. Um, please uh, do what you need to do back in the break room. We'll get you back out here in uh, hopefully a little under 10 minutes. Um, Mr. Crane will still be on the stand. He'll still be subject to direct examination, and we'll see where that goes. All right, thank you. All right, everybody, welcome back. That was Bill Crane's testimony from yesterday. We're going to continue playing that for you today. But what I want to talk to you about as we carefully watch the feed for the Tex MacGyver case, and as soon as we do have it, we'll make sure to go into it. Let's talk a little bit about that Black Lives Matter uh, statement, a big issue in this case. Again, I'm here with criminal defense attorney Mark Iglarsh. Black Lives Matter, um, whether it was said, whether it wasn't said, whether it was retracted, whether it wasn't retracted. How much does that play into this case in the sense that we know there was a reason why he took the gun out? Whether there was aliens, whether it was Black Lives Matter, does that really matter to the Diane MacGyver shooting? Not to me, not to you, but what about the jurors? Mm -hmm. What's the makeup of the jurors? I want to know, because depending upon the makeup of the jurors, and I'm not necessarily saying if they're black or they're white, but, but how they feel about somebody bringing that issue up. That could be offensive to some people. Wouldn't you hope that gets weaned out during the voir dire process, though, during the jury selection process? You would hope, but people are human. Right. Right? So they have certain feelings. Can you put aside any feeling? That, oh, sure I can. And then they bring that up, and it's like, you son of a bitch. You, you brought up, <laughs> you, you tried to cast a spurge. Did you use that? But I, I, this case is not going to be decided based upon that one single issue. It can't be. Well, the prosecution's really been honing in on that. I mean, yesterday they called Dr. Marty Sellers, who testified that when Diane died after operating on her, they went to go see Tex, inform him what happened. And he had a doctor with him who I believe was um, uh, an, Arab, an Arab doctor, Dr. Saeed. And, doctor, and MacGyver said to him, uh, don't tell me what to do, boy, after he said, um, Mr. MacGyver, take a seat. Why that matters, and I, I get what they're doing there, but why that matters, and why the judge is letting that in, and I, I'll never forget, the judge said, I'll allow this in, just don't make a big deal of it. Right. It's like, don't, prosecution, don't make a big deal of this, but it's allowed to be brought in. What it am I not so getting here? obvious to me what they're doing, having tried over 150 jury trials, sitting there going, I cannot believe the judge is letting this in. It's because the prosecution wants to make my guy look out to, look to be a bad guy. Right. That, that's it. It's, it's character assassination to make it easier for jurors to buy into the prosecution theory that he is an evil guy and intentionally shot her. I mean, the jury is not going to have an easy time. And speaking of this, the jury is coming back in. We have a live shot right there in the Tex MacGyver courtroom. That's Tex MacGyver right there. It's a live feed. Now, actually, Mark, as we watch him, I've watched him throughout the whole case, okay, and I've seen him react to different testimony. He has gotten emotional at certain times, particularly yesterday when Marty, Dr. Marty Sellers was talking about how Diane actually died. They, they looked at her body and talked about actually the bullet wound. How much does a jury look at the defendant throughout the case and say, you know what, uh, he looks emotional or he looks like somebody who's guilty or he looks like somebody, uh, what do they make of that? I love that question because it, 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 this is theater. Trials are not about finding the truth. You know, people say, we're going to get the truth. That's always crap. Prosecution's supposed to seek the truth, but, but they don't always do that, right? They just want a guilty verdict. And defense lawyers, we don't have that same burden. So this is theater here. And what we're telling this guy is the jurors are watching you. They're watching every move you make. They're going to make every inference from you. Make sure that you react appropriately. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating to watch it um, day in and day out because people are split. I mean, that's one of the great things about this case, and I'm so happy we're covering it here on Law and Crime, is people are split about whether or not this man is guilty. And when you, the interesting thing about it that's is... That's reasonable doubt. That's reasonable that's doubt. That's reasonable doubt. That's reasonable doubt. But do the jurors... Well, how, many, how important is those jury instructions to understand the actual law? We know the law. We've also been following a ton of different cases, but, and so have our viewers. They know it by now. But how much does a jury who doesn't, maybe has no experience in the courtroom whatsoever, how much do they understand what that concept means? Okay, here's what they need to know. And the, ju the jurors are going to hear the law, and it's going to be clear to them, and, and then the defense is going to argue. You can make a finding that what he did was completely negligent, to pull out a gun prematurely. There was nobody banging on the door. 
You can make the finding that he's a bad guy for doing some of the things that the prosecution brought out that should not have been brought out. But you don't have enough to show that he pulled that trigger intentionally, and that's reasonable doubt. You could think that maybe he did it, probably he did it, but that's not enough. It's well said. Hopefully, uh, see, this is why you need to be delivering the, uh, well, the that's what closing arguments. Argue. Sure. Now, as the judge right there, Judge McBurney, is speaking with Clint Rucker, the DA, and the other attorneys in this case um, before the trial starts, I do want to play you some more of the testimony of Bill Crane, the PR specialist, the friend of Tex MacGyver, trying to put out those statements after the shooting. Let's listen in from yesterday. I'll circle back. But let me, let's complete our discussion with respect to the memorial service. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, now, can you tell the jurors, um, were, were those two statements, the only couple of statements, he said something to you and then you said something back to him, or did the conversation continue? The conversation continued. And can you share with the jurors the remainder of the conversation? I reminded Tex that he told me in the initial conversations, and when I pressed him because I was going to be dealing with reporters, I knew that they were going to be asking me if he or Diana had been drinking. No, absolutely not. I reminded him later that he knew that he had alcohol and that Diana had consumed alcohol. I know that I'm not an expert on who had how much or anything like that, but that they had consumed alcohol. And so I pointed out to him I had already damaged myself by relaying something that wasn't true. And so during this meeting at the memorial service, you reminded him that, the, the, that he had told you when asked he had not been drinking. And Diane had not been drinking, that is correct. respond to that other than the head down again. Um, I made clear that I still wanted to help him, which I did and I do, that I didn't think he was being all that well served by his current legal counsel, <clears throat> that I understood if he had to cut ties with me because of the Black Lives Matter comment and that I understood if he didn't want to use my services anymore because I wasn't charging him, I was fine with that but that if I could be of further assistance, I would be. But I was not willing to lie about what he said to me. And I also felt it would not be helpful to his case if I was willing to lie to do that. All right, everybody, we are going back live into the courtroom in the Claude Tex MacGyver case out of Atlanta. Uh, they are working on some preliminary issues. I believe we have some audio. I'd like to listen in and hear what uh, they're discussing right now. There was an update that I'll talk to you about in a minute, but let's listen in live. Um. Okay, there's an interesting little tidbit here that I want our viewers to listen to. So the judge started the day by asking uh, Clinton Rucker, the prosecutor, if he planned to argue about Judge Craig Schwal. That's a separate judge. That's Judge McBurney. Judge Craig Schwal tipping off Tex MacGyver about MacGyver's arrest. Now, Judge Craig Schwal is the father of Austin Schwal. Austin was Diane's godson. You see how everything's related here, no, Mark? we need a chart. Ma Ma Mark, <laughs> we need a chart. <laughs> it's very <laughs> incestuous. Everybody knows each other. That's not good. That's not good. <laughs> Someone in the legal system tipping off Tex MacGyver about this? What do you make of this statement? Because we learned it yesterday when Bill Crane uh, came on the stand. Business as usual in small towns. There, I'm done. I don't practice there. Okay. <laughs> That's what's going on. It's Come an on. issue. You can't avoid yeah. it. Yeah. Um, so as they work on some preliminary issues today, what other witnesses do you think the prosecution needs to call. Let's, let's try to analyze it. They've analyzed his financial situation. They've analyzed her financial situation. They talked about the day of the shooting. They talked to investigators. They talked to hospital workers. Who else do they need to call? Need no one. Should maybe a few more loose ends because, again, they're not just fighting to tell the story. 
they're creating, uh, preventing the defense from creating reasonable doubt. So I get up there and I say reasonable doubt can be found from the evidence, the lack of evidence, or the conflicts in the evidence. And then I'll focus on the lack of evidence. Why didn't they call Mr. Jones? Mr. Jones could have said the following. So anyone that they don't call, I'm going to harp on. And I think yesterday, you make a good point, because yesterday they had to call a witness, um, an investigator from the DA's office, because what we learned right before they went on break a week ago was that the lead detective in this case didn't investigate the matter as thoroughly as the prosecution would have liked. He didn't ask uh, proper follow-up questions. He didn't do proper testing. There was, he didn't, the lead detective in this case, okay, said it doesn't really matter whether the gun was in single action or double action, someone got shot and killed. The lead detective in the case, yeah. a murder case. So uh, yesterday they had a, a, a DA a investigator come on and say, well, I, this is how I investigated. I investigated it after the Atlanta Police Department. So in your experience, Experience, how much during the course of a trial do you need to call supporting witnesses to say well even though X Y and Z testified to this we we investigated thoroughly with our own investigators you never want to be in that position especially in a serious case it's one thing if it's in a car theft and you figure 98 99 percent of those cases are going to resolve in plea bargains you'll never be cross-examined in court but on a murder case the presumption is it's likely especially when your lead defendant is a very well-known high-profile attorney it's likely going to go to trial so dot every i cross every t it's not a good position for the prosecutors not a good position to be in but let's listen in live okay that's bruce harvey uh, showing some exhibits too, and I think that's what they're talking about right now is the some exhibits that will be brought in. So let's listen in live into the courtroom. All right, we learned a couple of things just now. Uh, the state expects to rest by lunch. The defense will pick up the case by later today, and I know all of you are anticip anticipating that, which way they'll go. But one thing we just learned is that the attorneys are talking about medical examiner photos of Diane MacGyver's body. The defense is objecting to them, saying that they're just too gruesome. Um, they show entrance and exit wounds. I would imagine, Mark, that those shouldn't be let in, but why? what is the rationale to put them in there? I don't know what the prosecutor alleged, but add that to the list of things that they're doing to get the jurors upset at the guy that they want them to convict. Bad character evidence, they've been trying to get that in, and now they want to appeal directly to sympathy, which in the jury instructions is something that they're not allowed to do. That's what it's all about. Now, we're covering another case. We covered the Knight case where that exit and entrance wound uh, is interesting because we're trying to determine self-defense, which way was the bullet fired. But here, again, it's important to know which way the bullet was fired, But if it was, um, because if it was on his lap, which all accounts seem to say the gun was on his lap, and there was an upward trajectory of the bullet, which, again, all accounts seem to say, it's, again, could that be... A murder could that be an accident I, I think it could be both ways unless again of course if the prosecution wants to say this is an intentional shooting it would make more sense if he stuck his hand out but what, what do you make of it? here's the test any probative value meaning the benefits and and merit that it has always gets balanced against the prejudicial effect it's called a 403 balance and any possible benefit, in my opinion, is outweighed by the significant prejudice that this presents. Yeah, we're going to have to see which way that goes. Again, that's a live feed into the courtroom, and that's Danny Joe Carter. Okay, That's the woman who was driving the car when Diane was shot by Tex. And, and Mark, we talked about this in the break. Yeah. If you're going to kill your wife, would you really do it? in this way with Danny Joe Carter, another witness in the, in the car. Yeah, I feel like OJ. Well, if I did want to kill my wife, okay, <laughs> honey, if you're watching, he brought up the question. Uh, yeah, it's the most bizarre thing. Let's not um, kill her somewhere else. Let's do it in a car with a witness, and then my story is going to make me look like such an idiot, such a jackass for pulling out a gun and accidentally shooting my wife it just doesn't make any sense. And by the way, you'd have your story down if that's your plan. To change your testimony allegedly six times like he did, that's not good. Yeah, again, a question of was he trying to cover up a murder or he knew he, did, he, knew he was in trouble and trying to cover up that. Um, that's what we're really looking at to see what will happen. Should note, so we just got an update. Don Samuel, the defense attorney for the Tex MacGyver, said that the Tex MacGyver masseuse Annie Anderson will be one of their witnesses. Now, remember, the prosecution really tried to say there was something odd going on there between Tex MacGyver and this masseuse. She was around a lot after this shooting. So are you surprised that the defense is now calling her to the stand? Well, first of all, she was around a lot because he was tense. 
After the shooting, he needed release. She was there, the proper release. There's so many, so many ways I could go. <laughs> Do not go. Shoulders, okay. Um, yeah, this is great for the defense. Uh, they're not going to be able to impeach her. She's going to say whatever she wants to say. And if she's on team defense, then this is uh, good for, for him. Yeah, maybe we'll understand the relationship. And we know that she was around even before Diane uh, died. Uh, there's some more commentary going on in the courtroom, so let's listen in right now. All right, everybody, the jury's being brought in right now in the Claude Tex MacGyver case out of Atlanta. Again, a prominent attorney who's on trial for shooting and killing his wife, Diane MacGyver, shooting her from the back seat of a moving car. He is claiming, however, that this was all a tragic accident, while the prosecution is really trying to hone in on that financial motive. Now, I know we don't have a lot of time before the witness comes in, uh, but again, I'm here with criminal defense attorney Mark Iglarsh. The financial motive here. I'm still convinced that he had a lot more to gain with her being alive than with her being dead. I mean, she Tell was me the, why. She was the Make the argument. Here's my... Here's my that's not how I saw see, it. See, I see her being the breadwinner. She was bringing in the money. Right. You know, she was supplying their lifestyle. Trips, dinners. Now... She was tight, apparently. And again, don't, don't go off on that. She was tight with her money, apparently. She was tight yes. with the money. And I will say it was um, interesting that even if... I'll even counter my own argument that say yes. she, had, she loaned him money and why she would have to loan him money when everything is shared. But don't, I, don't 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 run through that. That but, point but, is key. But I do believe that they were married. She kept giving him, you know, extensions on the loan. I felt that he was in a better place financially with her being alive than her being dead. Well, uh, how do you I, see I just it? don't see it. You don't I mean, see it. Who, who lends their spouse money? If that, that's a definition of tight, right? And then I'll give you an extension, honey. You know that that money was hers, separated from him tightly controlled through a loan in one instance, and Lord knows if there was any other instance of where she ever gave him money. To me, I, I'm surprised that you see it the way you do. Well, the thing that I see it is, and this is why it's different from other um, marriages, is they came together later in life, right. right? So he was coming from being a partner in a law firm. She was running three successful businesses. She had $12 million, I think, at the time that they got together. So it's a little bit different than if they grew up together. They, they had their whole life together. But I still see a situation where, what is she going to do? Go on a trip without her husband? Oh, you can't afford your way? No, she was going to live her life. They were living at the ranch together. They were playing golf. They were going to dinners. They were going on trips. She was a big factor in making that happen. And mm -hmm. I don't see why, if you have such a great life, why killing her would be a better option because he didn't even know he could collect her social security checks. He didn't know if he could collect her for uh, 401k. He, these were questions he asked. Know, how do you know that he didn't know that? He's oh, because afterwards, guy. afterwards, yeah. he asked Jay Grover, somebody that worked, he goes, can I collect her social security checks or how do I get her 401k? He tried to sit on a board. He, he, he needed money after she died. Okay, let's ask it this way. What did he definitely get? As well, a result. well, I know. Well, uh, Mark, stand by. We have the that. next witness. We'll we'll talk about that in a minute. But we shouldn't. We don't want to miss anything. This is the next witness on the stand. Let's listen in. Quick sidebar there in the Tex MacGyver case. Again, I'm here with Mark Iglarsh. And right before we went to uh, uh, go live in the courtroom, we were talking about what would Tex MacGyver gain by shooting and killing his wife Mula. and his money. Mula, his money. Now, now we know his, his position was going down. He was, his financial position was deteriorating. Okay, stop. That's yeah. huge. I was going to ask you before the break, yeah. that when I was cross-examining you, like you're <laughs> one of my, you know. Trust witnesses. me, I, I felt the heat of it. Right. But we do know that he did receive a cash infusion um, when she died. And there's, uh, wait, I think we're back on the stand with this next witness. Mark, stand by. We you will get to the session. by these witnesses. We will come back. Let's yeah. listen in live to this witness. All right, so we're learning about cell phone towers from this FBI agent. We'll jump back into court in a minute. Unfortunately, everybody, I have to say so long to my guest from this morning, criminal defense attorney Mark Iglarsh. Now, before I sign off, Mark, as a great criminal defense attorney, what would your advice be to the defense as they take up the case later today? I would say keep it brief. The biggest mistake defense lawyers take on is the burden of proof. You know, even though they don't, and the judge says the burden's on the state, the defense says, well, we've got to put on a lot of witnesses. And the, 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 the jurors, they start to go, well, wait, the state was better than the defense. They put on more witnesses, and we like them better. I know that's not what the jury instructions are, but that's how they perceive it sometimes. So filet mignon, keep it lean, keep it mean, and just put on what you need to put on. I like that. And I'm now hungry, so thank you for that. <laughs> Mark Iglarsh, everybody, thank you so much for coming in. Thanks, my friend. All right, everybody, let's go back live into the Claude Tex MacGyver courtroom.